it's a cold morning. <laughs> it's uh, Wednesday here. And oh, I'm in the way. It's a cold morning. It's uh, 29 degrees out here. And it's Wednesday. So <laughs> we're going to go ahead and move. Probably uh, once Emma is back. But whew, it's cold. Brisk. <sighs> Ugh. Already a half tank. So the interesting thing is, when I woke up at 3.30 this morning, it was 29 degrees out, but the uh, battery bay was 45 degrees. So that's good. You cannot charge lithiums if the batteries are frozen. A lot of folks ask, you know, what do we do when it gets cold? And above freezing, of course, just add blankets, maybe wear a hat, uh, you know, throw on a couple layers. And that'll keep you warm because you don't want to burn right through that propane. When it gets cold, just keep the temperatures above freezing. Um, we have tank heaters, so we'll run those when the generator's running, uh, but we will not run those, of course, uh, when we are uh, just on the battery power. We've been pretty lucky, so we'll run the furnace. I'll run it when Emma's waking up, and then, you know, let her get ready when she's nice and warm, and then she rides to work. Every few hours, you might want to run that generator and furnace, so probably not a bad idea. Just conserve on your on your fuels. Not a big deal. We've been doing a really good job at cutting sugar the last four days or so, but I'm starting to get a caffeine headache, so I need to go get something, uh, <laughs> something just to to cut that. Otherwise, I'm feeling a lot better. The you know a lot less inflammation and stuff, but um, less sugar, less caffeine. I did also switch to my Merrells. I love these boots, they're incredibly comfortable and they're pretty well insulated, they're pretty warm. We went out for a couple hour long ride yesterday and uh, towards the end it was getting pretty, pretty chilly with just jeans on and, and even with these boots, I, you know, everything starts to get cold after a while, but this is a, uh, it's kind of a Google campus, there's some stores in here, it's kind of neat, so you've got a couple Google buildings, but POC is right down here. Not quite a full moon anymore. I guess yesterday was, but what a beauty. Yeah, that QFC might be kind of the closest thing to like Whole Foods, and I'm sure they're trying to compete, right? Uh, but they have all the like huge organic section, and you walk in and it's like, do you guys have any of the crappy foods that I normally eat? But uh, I will say seven, eight bucks a gallon for milk little much for me. Still these beautiful fall colors. Man. It really is nice. Some of the leaves have been all blown off some of these trees, but I'm guessing that there's enough like cover from wind out here that they get to hold on just a little bit longer. I like that. And we're back. And I don't know what this is all about. I think somebody just happened to forget their cooler here on lunch one day or maybe they tossed it or something but I hope they don't think that was us you would hope not but we have been accused of littering but I don't know why I would litter a big old igloo cooler we could pick it up and toss it out for them that's one option but at the same time like if somebody did leave it there on accident, they might be happy to have it back. <laughs> if it's still there in another, the next time we're here, I'll, I'll just toss it. I don't want to get blamed for that. That's a shame. If you've ever been curious about kind of how I work from home, uh, it's basically exactly what you would do from an office. And uh, my job title is system administrator. So um, I make sure that all of our devices in my company are running smoothly. I primarily focus on the, the Mac side of things, uh, but I will 
touch on the windows side of things if i really have to uh they for whatever reason they gave me the keys to the palace so <laughs> just like with anybody you know i i fire up my machine i start with the emails do i have anything pressing uh what do i need to throw into the spam folder then i fire up microsoft teams see if anybody needs anything and then i'll head into uh you know, we use a couple of different tools to manage our devices and I head in there. I check for anomalies. If I'm working on a project, I do whatever it takes to get that going. I check for any issues and then tickets will come in and they'll say, Hey, this is broken, fix it. And then I do all the troubleshooting. And uh, generally speaking, my job is to obviously be there when, a, when the, the end user needs it. And I'm generally working with like CEOs and uh, VPs and, and things like that. But you know, ideally, if I can stop an issue or fix an issue before it uh, is ever noticed by the end user, that's what I do. Um, and I can do it all from a laptop. And then, you know, obviously, uh, mobile internet as well. So in that regard, there's no reason that anybody couldn't do this job remotely. Uh, there, if you work in IT, you know, there's some things. So if you do like hardware deployment, right, that's gonna be an on-site thing. If you do network deployments or certain infrastructure jobs, obviously that's going to be an on-site thing. But for the majority of us, we can all work remotely and that's a wonderful thing. And I think about all the jobs that can be remote, there are so, so, so many. I mean, uh, accountants a lot of times can be remote. Uh, that we, we have so much software that we can use today that just keeps things running smoothly. So why not? And then we can communicate faster than ever before. So, and not that it's, you know, I, I would say that some people are definitely face-to-face -face kind of folks. Um, I'm one of those people that face-to-face -face is fine for a short period of time, but over, over, you know, over time, it just becomes overwhelming. So being able to, to work remotely and provide value to a company, all from the comforts of home, wherever that happens to be, is, uh, that's a real, uh, talk about a blessing, I'll tell you. <laughs> Anyways, we'll get back to work. Good boy. Good boy. Two slightly smaller pieces of steak and then some top ramen. The beef beret. <laughs> There's a lot of beef on this plate right now. <laughs> so I've noticed a lot of uh, a lot of inflammation, especially in my fingers and in my face, uh, and just generally not feeling good. Uh, I had a doctor one time diagnose me with fibromyalgia, <laughs> which is generally only found in women. Like there are some men that could have it. But in this case, uh, I ended up finding that if I just cut sugar and caffeine as well, just because caffeine makes me crave sugar, uh, I end up feeling a lot better. We, and especially uh, if I eat just one meal a day, which for some folks sounds crazy. 
Yeah, but in the beginning, whenever we do this, because sometimes we just fall off the rails, right? Nobody's perfect. What we usually end up doing is we'll have like a window where we'll just eat between, say, 8 a.m. and noon. And right now is almost noon. And then, of course, with that, because you're only eating one meal, you want to eat a little bit healthier. So less sugar. Now, uh, noodles, of course, you know, there's some sugar or there's a lot of carbohydrates that will turn into sugar. I'm no nutritionist by any means, but... I noticed that this is a little easier to transition to, and then eventually we'll just eat basically, um, you know, vegetables, meat, occasionally fruit, you know, whatever it is. Um, not to be too strict or anything like that, but I find that my body works best when I basically kind of eat just one meal um, or within that window, and then the rest of the time I let my body process it. Some people can't deal with the hunger, but for whatever reason for me, that hunger kind of gives me a little bit of energy. Like it makes me feel like I'm doing the right thing. It's, it's very interesting. I actually end up not getting too hungry. My body kind of adjusts. A lot of people follow like the keto, OMAD kind of thing. Um, and that's sort of loosely what, what we're sort of doing. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult for Emma because I can cook whatever we have. Emma has to bring it with her, so. But she's been doing pretty good with that as well. And uh, like today, she's she brought a chicken pot pie, something with a little bit of fat in there to keep keep her going, uh, which is part of why I like steak. There's a lot of fat in there. Um, but the fat really helps sustain because I noticed that if I eat a lot of carbs, I want to eat more carbs, right? Um, and, and it's the sodas that are generally like the hardest thing for me to quit. Let me dig into this real quick. I think it's cool enough. Slightly overcooked. <laughs> they were uh, a little more frozen and I didn't want to wait to defrost them. So that's what I get for being impatient. It's still pretty good. All right. We are going to head out of here. So the quick walk around. Um, we just don't overstay our welcome, of course. And it's Wednesday. The nice thing is we have Friday off. So uh, whatever we do tomorrow, I'll probably drive her to work because it's getting pretty darn cold. And then we'll just go somewhere for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's nice to have three days off, but we also don't want to waste miles. So I don't know, we'll see. All right, let's get going. So this is uh, the question of the day. So basically a woman called into the show and she goes, hey, you know, in uh, another 18 months, I'll be retiring, moving out to Oregon and I want a full time in an RV. Should I buy an RV locally? Uh, and she may have had like a couple other questions. The video creator's response was essentially, like 18 months is not enough time. Like you're gonna get screwed. You need to do a lot more research. Um, you got a lot of work to do, and it's just a terrible idea. You need to find somebody who is knowledgeable in RVs to help make the decision. It, it kind of went on like that, and it, because really the question I think she was searching for is like, where should I buy? And maybe even a little bit of like, what should I buy? Which is, I think, okay to, to ask. And I think that's the point of reaching out to shows uh, like his, which I, I think is good. Like people are reaching out online and, and saying, hey, I kind of would like a resource. Um, I don't know where to start. And I think. Well, I guess, what do you think first? I think that once you determine that you have enough information to feel confident in your decision, I think that's when you move forward. I think that you don't, like, I don't think you can put a time limit on when someone's ready to make a decision. Right. So like saying 18 months is not enough time, I don't think is valid because I could be, I could do all the research and feel confident in my choice in two weeks. Um, and, you know, I think that's just different per person. So maybe he won't feel confident in 18 months, but I might. Um, and I also think that if you get into a pattern of, like, research and research and research and research, like, you're going to get stuck in that, that routine of research, and you're never going to move forward. Analysis paralysis. Yeah, analysis paralysis. And then, like, I am the kind of person, like, I would rather jump into it and try it, and then if I have to make a change down the road, then I do. Um... But I would rather go do rather than sit and wait and think about it. Well, and I think that like, so I think that by reaching out, they're, they're, they're asking for a resource and maybe they don't have a, a friend to go RV shopping with them. But I do think that it's a good idea if you have the option, why not? Yeah. And honestly, I'd love to go RV shopping with people. Like I'd, I'd set up a service like 30 bucks. Let's go, you pay me 30 bucks and we'll go out and we'll, 
I'll share everything I know, right? I think that'd be a fun little service to offer. That'd be fun. But um, I, I think that 18 months is ridiculous, I, personally. Like, I'm one of those people where it's okay to make a mistake, and it all depends on the person's attitude, right? If you need it to be perfect, and it's the only, and it's the last RV, and you, you're you on a very limited, or you're, you're very frugal with your money, and it's not gonna work for you. Just don't, don't do the RV lifestyle. Like, it's one of those things. But if you're like, hey, you know, I'm okay making mistakes or uh, it's going to be an experience. Like, no matter what it is, it's just going to be a big experience. I think that's the right mindset to go on with and you don't need to, you know. Well, Ian, like, we have been doing this for, you've been doing it for seven years and have been in, like, six or seven different RVs. Like, part of it is, like, you don't know what you like until you're in it. Like, there's a practicality piece. Like, there are th some things that just work better for us. And then we chose other things because we like the functionality better for a certain purposes. Well, and your taste changes because your life is going to change. Because when you live in a, in a house, and and I say this with like all due respect to anybody who lives in a house, it's just a different life. You're going to be a different person if you move into an RV full time. You may learn that you love to travel. That's a big change. And I may have picked a huge fifth wheel to travel in. And that was the, you know, hey, I need to be a little bit more nimble. I'm more portable. I want to drive in the cities a little bit more. I want to visit family and they have smaller driveways and I really don't need all that space. Or if you're a person that like is used to staying in hotels and so you pick a big luxury class A because that's what you think is going to big best match pusher. your truck, your travel style. Yep. And then you find that you're a person who actually really likes to go out to the country and back road, like back road and off road. Like obviously a big class A is not the right for that. Like your lifestyle is changing. Your choices are changing. Yep. You're finding other things that you enjoy, and so you choose it. Then you may have to go and choose something like the Black Series instead, or whatever. Uh, or yeah, something just generally smaller. And I think that you know you may get rid of, you may digitize all of your photos, right? So you don't need to store those any longer. But then you realize, okay, well I digitize that, and then I can digitize this, and I can, you know, I can save these memories in other ways. You just got like, rid of a lot of stuff. Now you don't need the storage for it, right? Or you may also like consider initially, like I had done, like I wanted to get in as cheaply as possible and I did and I loved it. And then as finances allowed, I moved up. Like that's okay too. So I think that if you, if you make the wrong decision, at least you learn from it, right? And ideally, you know, there are ways, if you're on a real tight budget, there are ways around you know, all of that, there are better decisions to be made, but you, you might decide that the Monaco is the best motorhome ever built. It's the only RV for you. And then you get into it and it's just, you got a lemon, right? So like things happen. Right. And I think the other thing too, is like, if you're the kind of person that really wants to get something that's flexible and customizable, maybe you decide to buy something used, mm -hmm. like maybe a new product isn't what you buy. And so like, right. I think that just like knowing yourself and then like, Learn, like knowing that you're going to change because uh, we're always changing right because like, that's what people do that's what everybody does yeah and yeah. people people take that for granted right like or they just don't even consciously recognize that fact that we are always changing well and i think it's funny because i used to live in a house and i used to work my job and then go home and sit in my room in a basement of a house i shared with roommates and then i started moving with joel we started dating and we lived in the airstream and the rvs and that was our, that was how my life had changed um which i think is a very positive change and then um last january when he was in arizona waiting for the esteem and i had to come back and uh and work um and i was staying with his mom and driving an hour and a half to and from work every day and like literally get up go to work drive to work sit in the car be so exhausted at the end of the day drive back and then sit on the couch like I, I remember calling Joel and being like, this sucks. Like, I do not like this. Um, it feels way different to work this job doing it this way versus, like, the way we do it. Where, like, we still have our end of our day. We go out and take the dogs for walks. We go out for bike rides. Like, I'm not spending three hours of my day driving back and forth. Like, I think that it wasn't until that point I realized exactly how much my life had, like, shifted. Like, I knew, but I didn't, like, feel the change as much until I went back to a similar lifestyle. Well, but I think at the end of the day, like, you don't know what you don't know, and you'll never know what you don't know, right? 
Uh, some things, yes, other people can say, let's talk about build quality, let's talk about price, let's talk about how to get support afterwards, or um, alternative ways to get support, right? And I think that really what needs to happen in this crazy RV world is we really need to start banding together and offering kind of um, a co-support model, right? <laughs> Where like we share skills, we need like a skill swapping type thing. But I think that yes, there are some basic facts you need to learn. Maybe you want bigger tanks, for example. Somebody needs to help you with those things. I think that going onto forums is a great way if you don't know anybody in person. But I also think that you don't, it doesn't need to take you years and years, right? Um, how long did you wait to, you know, how, how much research did you do before you bought your house, right? Or children, like how long did you wait before you, <laughs> you had kids? How much research did you need to do? Not that you shouldn't <laughs> do research, but like, how, how much was it? And how do you know when you're actually ready? Right, how do you know it? Yeah. And if you make a mistake, is it the end of the world for you? Or can you deal with it? And I think if you if you do have the right attitude, I don't think it'll be a problem at all. That's just me. I also think that if you're afraid and you are ready to downsize, basically go get a go get a van, live with your minimum, and add in as you go, right? And just because you have the money for a big, huge, expensive rig, you know, when you're making such a big change, maybe it is okay to say, you know, I don't know it all yet, and I'm not willing to risk this large financial investment yet, right? My nest egg from your from selling your house. But you know what? I can put my stuff into storage and I can get a small and expensive rig and live that way for a little while. Uh, but, you know, because that's, that is definitely an option as well. And then you start out with a bed and some water and then you add a fan or you, know, you just, you know, solar panels and... Man City Van Life did this. He started with literally an empty van and yep. a bed and then he figured out what worked and he added stuff in as he realized what he needed and as he figured out how to make it work in the van. And like if you look at a lot of people think it's crazy for two people and two dogs to live in a minivan and uh, actually we've gotten some crazy comments. I think that like at the same time it's a nice reset. It really to me it's a really nice reset to say wow we don't have much of anything at all yet somehow we're still alive we're still making do and when we get our rig, it's gonna be so much nicer because of that. If you think about it, a lot of people are like, well, you have to have all these skills before you go in RV. And tell me how many people can rebuild a, a car engine? Nobody, like nobody that, that we know at least. Okay. Um, and it, not to say that you, it's a bad thing to have those skills, it's a great thing to have those skills, but most of us don't have those skills. And yet somehow we still make do. And so I'm not saying throw all caution to the wind, but um, I, I think, on the flip side, it's, I, I don't know. We're just, there's two ways to look at it where you have to be perfect or you're gonna make things happen no matter what. And we are sort of on the latter half of that. Yeah. So what do you guys think? If you're gonna be giving advice to a woman that's gonna be setting out, she's gonna be selling her house, she wants to move to Oregon from uh, the Midwest, wants to buy her first RV, what advice do you have? Or how much time do you think you actually need to research? Yeah. A lifestyle change like this. How, how prepared, me, me, you know, yeah, how prepared do you really need to be? Um, I think it really comes down to emotional fitness more than anything. And, you know, people that are wildly neurotic and that don't handle change well, they're definitely obviously not the ideal candidate for this sort of work. This is something that's come up at work recently, too, even in my conversations. Like, there's, like, the locus of control, like, the things that you feel like need to be in your control versus things that are just out of your control. And, like, I think that living this way, you have to be very flexible in your thinking. And, like, you have to be okay with there being quite a few things that are out of your control. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You don't need all the things to be in your control all the time. Right. And I, I think that what you get to control, obviously, is you and how you respond to your environment and to some degree obviously how you prepare your environment but you can only do so much and for the rest of it it's essentially radical acceptance you know radically accepting where you are what is happening and that you know oh my gosh I have a you know a leak or I have uh, my furnace isn't working or a 
fuse is blown or I don't have power or whatever it is, right? You can radically accept it, but also, you know, so you recognize like, okay, I want it to improve. It's okay though, I'm okay. Let's take, let's take a breather and also still be uh, appreciative that you still have a home, right? right? Or you still have, you know, whatever it is. You still have your health. But yeah, what do you guys think? Uh, am I, are we like way off base? Are we just crazy or what? I don't know. Are we just really dull with the flow kind of people and mm -hmm. we're in the minority here? Yeah. I, I also, I just think about all the, how we send kids to college. <laughs> to go so, 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 so much farther into debt for some of these kids than, than an RV, you know, a, tra a travel trailer or fifth wheel would cost. Um, and they know, you know, next to nothing. They don't even know themselves, right? And that's okay, but you know, with a purchase like this or a big life change like this, which doesn't have to be negative at all. I don't think it is negative. I think it's a quite quite a positive thing for almost anyone who, who so chooses. I think what it is, is I think people are used to being told what to do. You're told to get a house, you're told to go to college, you're told to get married, you're told to have kids. So all those things must be acceptable choices. But in an instance like this, where you're choosing an alternative lifestyle, it's out of the norm. It's not something you're told to do. It's actually frowned upon in a lot of cultures and societies. And so I think yep. that a lot of people pause a lot more and think that they need to do a lot more analysis of that choice. To get because, it perfect. Right. Because it's not what you're, everyone is always just told to do. Yep. Yep, and I, I think uh, if you pull the stigma out of it and you, you pull the, the perceptions of others, which I think is the hardest part to get over, um, and you just deal with the facts and there's only a couple things to learn, a couple basic things to learn to find your right rig and then realize like, it may not be perfect. Sometimes you can make it perfect. Sometimes you gotta get something else. Yeah. It's supposed to get down to about 30 degrees tonight again. So cold, but no rain. So that's good. Yeah, otherwise we're just gonna hang out here. We're a little crooked, but if we're leaving in the morning so that Emma doesn't have to ride in the, what we would consider brutal cold, then uh, no sense putting those jacks down. But hey, thanks for watching guys. And let us know your thoughts in the comments below. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.